You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 145. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglevich. This week we bring you Woman Called Witch by Doug McIntyre. Doug McIntyre is a Central Texas author who writes computer training by day and horror fiction by night. He has been writing horror for a couple of years now. In addition to this piece, he's been published in the Tiny Globule. He also has stories coming out soon in SNM Horror Magazine and The Monsters Next Door. In his free time, he likes to ride his Harley Davidson motorcycle or spend time with his wife and two children. You can visit his website at www.dougmcintyre.com to learn more about him and his writing. You can also find him on MySpace and Facebook. Woman Called Witch by Doug McIntyre If you didn't know any better, you might call her a witch. At least that's what she said. I don't know what the hell she is. For all I know, she might be a demon. Maybe an angel. It's hard to tell. The day I met her, I was standing in line at the bank, waiting to cash one of those damn $7 rebate checks. It was lunchtime, and the line was long. When I first walked in, I almost turned around and walked right back out. But then I would have wasted my trip to the bank. Hell. All for a lousy seven bucks. It looked like all three tellers were working, so I didn't think it would take too long. I was wrong. Ten minutes later, and I'd only made it halfway up to the front. The tellers were taking forever to wait on their customers. I don't know what their deal was, but it was really starting to annoy me. I had just decided to walk out when three armed men burst through the front doors. They all had ski masks on. One of them had a shotgun, and he seemed to be in charge. He shot a round into the air and purposefully pumped another round into the chamber of the weapon. I don't know if you have ever heard a shotgun go off in an enclosed space, but I'll tell you, it's quite an attention-getter. Everybody! Down on the ground! He screamed. The shotgun blast was deafening, but I heard enough of what he said to get down. Maybe it was because that's what everyone else was doing. Maybe it was because it's a natural instinct to get down when someone's shooting a shotgun in a bank. I don't really know. But it wasn't at all like you see in the movies. On screen, everyone gets down nice and easy, like they don't want to get hurt or dirty. I got down so fast that I don't remember doing it. One moment I was standing there, and the next I was flat on the floor. The guys with the guns all started yelling at once and pushing people around. Everybody it was chaotic. I just stayed where I was and kept my head down, trying not to look around. I think I was trying to hide, to make myself tiny enough that they wouldn't notice me. It seemed like a good idea. I remember thinking that I could give them the fucking $7 rebate check. I sure didn't want it anymore. Just when it looked like things were calming down, we heard the sirens outside, and it was all chaos again. A dozen squad cars must have all converged on the bank at once. The robbers started swearing. They had already been cussing, but before they were using the words in full sentences, like, get the fuck down. Now the cuss words were sentences all by themselves, like, shit, or damn, and the ever-popular fuck. The leader demanded to know who tripped the silent alarm. None of the bank employees would own up to it. I thought the leader was going to start beating them, but there were too many other things going on right then for him to add battery to his armed robbery charge. I noticed that once the police showed up, the other two gunmen seemed to get skittish, like they were afraid. But if the leader was afraid, I couldn't tell. He seemed to be more in control now than he had been before, like he was focused or something. He started barking orders. The robbers got us up, one or two of us at a time, and started moving us out of the lobby. We were in front of the big plate glass windows, they wanted to get us out of sight. There was a break room down a hall, and that's where they put us. It was almost my turn to move to the break room when the strangest thing happened. The front door opened. I could tell because all of a sudden the sound of the siren seemed closer, louder. What the fuck? I heard the leader say. It was like he had more to say, but his voice just drifted off. I turned my head to look. Standing there in the doorway was an old woman. It was just one of those things, so out of place that I had a hard time wrapping my mind around what I was seeing. I'd expected to find a SWAT team boiling through the front door, but she was there all alone. 
I don't know how she made it through the line of cops that must have been surrounding the building. Surely they would not have let an old woman come into the bank. The leader finally found his voice and yelled at her. Get the fuck out of here! I thought you wanted hostages, she said. Her voice was so sweet and so disturbing all at the same time. It's hard to describe. The leader looked at her a long time, trying to decide whether he wanted her to come in or go back out. Evidently, the idea of a little old lady coming in to volunteer herself as a hostage was a bit outside of his range of experience. Fine! He finally yelled at her. Get in here and get down on the floor! Young man, she said, I'll come in there, but I'm far too old to get down on the ground. The old woman slowly hobbled her way into the bank, leaning heavily on a cane. At first I thought she must be some kind of a decoy. You know, a cop dressed up like an old lady. But that wasn't it. She was real and she looked positively ancient. Her skin was weathered and crinkled with deep crevices lining her features. She was so dark from what I took to be years in the sun that I was unable to adequately discern her heritage. Once she was completely inside, the leader of the group went up to her and, and pulled out a pistol from his waistband. He placed the barrel of the gun up against her head. I said, get down on the ground or... He told her, drawing out the words for emphasis. Or what, you'll shoot me? she asked. That's right, old woman, he said. You're not going to shoot me, Billy Williams, she said, speaking his name like she used to babysit for him back when he was still a petulant child. Her words had a visible effect on the man. She must have nailed his name right on the head, even through the ski mask that still hid his identity. How do you know my name? he asked, uncertainty apparent in his speech. Oh, I know a lot about you. I expected her to elaborate on what else she might know, but she didn't, and the man just stared at her, the barrel of his pistol still pressed against her forehead. I gave it better than a 50-50 chance that he would pull the trigger, but he didn't. He lowered the gun, leaving a round circular mark where it had been against her skin. Have a seat, he snarled, pointing with his pistol over toward the waiting area in an overstuffed leather chair. Thank you, she said. She slowly made her way over to it. I thought about his name, the one the old woman called him by, Billy Williams. Was that short for William Williams? Why would his parents have named him that? I thought that he must have been picked on a lot at school. No wonder he went into a life of crime. It wasn't like William was a bad first name, or a last name for that matter. It's just that they were both the same. Who would do that? The robbers finally got us all moved into the break room. We sat on the floor, our backs up against one wall, all facing the same direction so the gunman could cover us with a minimal amount of effort. Everyone except the old woman. One of the gunmen moved in a cushioned chair for her. She sat on it regally as if it were her throne. Her cane stood on the floor vertically in front of her, her hands resting atop it, though she wasn't actually leaning on it. Her posture was perfect as she sat there. Her back was straight as an arrow. She was the only one of us that was afforded any semblance of comfort. The rest of us had been searched as we came into the break room. They made me empty my pockets of keys, wallet, fingernail clippers, anything of value or that could be used as a weapon, which is to say, everything. I didn't have the rebate check anymore. I must have dropped it out in the lobby when I got down on the floor. The women gave up their purses and jewelry. They even had to take off their shoes. That is, all except the old woman in the comfortable chair. I don't recall them searching her. Don't be afraid, she said, talking to the hostages rather than the gunmen. You're all going to be just fine. You! Shut your fucking mouth! The leader, Billy, yelled at her. He didn't wear his ski mask anymore, not since she'd said his name out loud. Or what? she asked defiantly. Or I'm going to shut it for you, permanently, he said. He was intentionally being ugly. I knew that. It was to create fear among the hostages. And it worked, too, at least on me. But not her. I am not afraid of you, she said. She didn't raise her voice or anything. She still sounded so sweet. He walked over to her. You should be, he said. His voice held menace. He was staring intently at the old woman. And I know that if it had been me sitting there, I probably would have shit myself. No, Billy, she said. You are the one who should be afraid. Why is that? he asked, nervous amusement in his voice. Because I'm going to walk out of here. You are not, she said matter-of-factly. 
He stared at her for a long time, not responding, just looking into her eyes. She didn't waver. She didn't even blink. At least not that I saw. Psh, he said finally, making a sound like a bottle of beer being opened. Then he turned away. He was still trying to act like he was in control, but he wasn't. And he knew it. The old woman knew it, too. Hell, even I knew it. We waited for the phone to ring. That's what always happened in the movies. The police would call the robbers to find out what their demands were. Then they would stall and their snipers would shoot the gunmen all at once while the rest of the cops would bust through the door to take the hostages out just in time for the evening news. These cops must not have gotten that training. They were remaining inexcusably silent. It was having an effect, though. The gunmen were beginning to look like they were wearing down. The leader approached the old woman again. You! He exclaimed to her. You're going to go out there and give the cops our demands. No, was her only reply. What do you mean, no? It wasn't really a question. It was more of an accusation of disbelief. Looking back on it, I'm pretty sure that she made him nervous and that he was just trying to get her out of there, away from him. He was probably having regrets about letting her into the building in the first place. I mean, she said, drawing out her words, that I'm staying right here. Once again, he just stared at her. Who are you? He finally asked. Some call me witch, she said. Witch what? He asked. Not witch. Witch. W-I-T-C-H, she said, spelling out the letters. Is that your name? He asked. No, it's just what some call me, she said. So what's your name? Heavens, she exclaimed. I don't remember. <laughs> she chuckled at that. He stared at her. He was supposed to be the one in charge. He was supposed to be scary. And she was screwing all of that up for him. I don't think he liked it, but there didn't seem to be much he could do about it. So he turned on his heels and stormed off again. I woke up. Not even remembering when it was, I fell asleep. I looked around. It was dark outside. I didn't know what time it was. The other hostages were dozing for the most part. Everyone except Witch. She was wide awake, looking as prim and proper as ever. One of the gunmen was snoozing. I'd overheard them talking about sleeping in shifts. The cops still hadn't called. That seemed unusual, even to me. But if it was making me nervous, it was driving the robbers bonkers. The woman, witch, was watching Billy Williams. He was trying not to look her way, but it didn't seem like he could help it. Come here, Billy, she finally said to him, laying the cane down on the floor beside her and waving him closer with her free hand. I don't know if she knew I was watching or not. I suppose she did, but I can't say for sure. The other gunman, the one who wasn't sleeping, was out in the lobby, guarding the entrances, making sure the cops didn't sneak in on them. Billy was here, guarding the hostages all alone. He went over to her, like he didn't have a choice. He looked exhausted. I could see it in his eyes. They were all red and bloodshot. Kneel down, she told him. He did. He knelt right there in front of her. He didn't even have his gun out. It was as if she had totally disarmed him. Once he was on his knees in front of her, she took both of her hands and placed them on either side of his face, drawing him in toward her. You know who I am, she said. It wasn't a question. No, he responded. Yes, you do, she said. Her voice changed. It was no longer that of the sweet old lady. It carried more of an edge. There was steel just below the surface of her frailty. I think it was then that I realized that I didn't know what she was. But I did know that she wasn't an old woman. She was ancient. Ancient not in the sense that she'd lived a long life. Ancient in the sense that she was old beyond reckoning. Old beyond description. Old beyond understanding. Suddenly, I realized that I shouldn't be listening to her. She must have thought me asleep like the other hostages. What she was doing, no one was to see. Not his men, not the hostages, and not me. I tried not to move. I closed my eyes, all but a slit, feigning slumber. I couldn't let her see me. I couldn't let her know that I was awake. Yes, I know who you are, Billy Williams finally admitted. 
I noticed an odor and tried to place it. It was a moment before I realized that Billy had lost control of his bladder. He was afraid. There now, she said soothingly. You have always known who I was, she cooed. You have always known that I'd come for you. I didn't know it'd be so soon, Billy replied, nearly whining. I couldn't see clearly because he wasn't facing me, but it sounded like tears might be welling in his eyes. I don't know if what I saw next was real or not, because of the way I was trying to keep my eyes as slits. I wasn't watching Billy. I was watching her. She became blurry, like I was seeing two images of her, one from each eye. One image, I don't know whether it was from my right eye or my left, looked normal, like the old woman I'd become accustomed to seeing. But the other image looked dark, shadowy, like nighttime, and the shape was different, too. It was bigger and bulkier. I don't know whether it was something I saw or something I imagined, but she looked evil to me in that image. It surprised me. I wanted to turn my face away, but I was afraid that she might notice. I was afraid that her attention would be drawn to me instead of Billy. All I could think was that it was my own fatigue playing tricks on me. I must have been seeing things. I don't know what happened next. It wasn't like I could see anything go between them. You know, like in the movies when someone sucks the life force out of someone else. You see those wisps, those tendrils of life that go from one mouth to the other. I didn't see anything like that. I just saw her remove her hands from the sides of Billy's face as she sat back into the chair. The dual images of her seemed to merge back into one. Billy continued to kneel there for a few seconds before toppling over onto the floor. I don't remember hearing anything as he fell. No sound at all. I would have thought that I could hear something. I didn't. Once Billy keeled over onto the floor, he didn't move again. I realized that he was dead. I stared at him. I don't know if I fully opened my eyes or what. Maybe she'd known I was watching all along, but I wasn't aware that her attention had turned to me until she spoke. What's the matter? Ain't you ever seen a dead man? She asked. I looked up at her, blinking in confusion when I realized that she was talking to me. No, ma'am. I haven't, I told her honestly. I mean, I've seen dead bodies at funerals. My eyes drifted back down to Billy's lifeless corpse. But not like this. Not like what? she asked. Her voice had returned to the sweetness that seemed to fit her. Not, uh, I don't know. You mean you ain't never seen a man killed before? she clarified. Yeah, maybe that's it, I told her. Well, now you have, she said as if it was the most normal thing in the world. Yeah, I said without much enthusiasm. Now I have. She scowled at me. Now, don't go being like that. Death is just the final part of life. When I didn't say anything, she continued. Look at him. How would you like him to date your daughter? How did she know that I had a daughter? Would you want anyone's daughter dating him? You think he didn't deserve what he got? Oh, I, I, I suppose he deserved something. I'm just not sure it was this, I told her. I hated to disagree with her. She seemed nice enough, but I knew she wasn't. She scared Billy, and I don't think he was the type to scare easily. I remembered how he'd pissed his pants. You make it sound like death is a punishment, she said. Yes, ma'am. I, I guess I do, I agreed. Not for a man like Billy, she said. For him, death was the release. It was his life that was the punishment. He didn't fit in, never did. So he turned to drink and drugs and crime, trying to find a place where he'd fit, where the pain couldn't find him no more. Now he has, she said glancing down at the lifeless corpse at her feet. She made it sound sweet, like her old lady perfume. But I knew it wasn't. I'd heard the fear in Billy's voice. I'd smelt the piss. He wasn't happy about what was happening to him. I didn't care what the woman called Witch said. I can tell you don't believe me, she said. My breath caught in my chest, afraid that she might do to me what she did to Billy. I didn't want to make her mad. All she'd done was place her hands on the sides of Billy's head. Don't worry, she <laughs> chuckled softly. I'm not here for you. Not today. 
<laughs> she chuckled again, like someone who knows a secret that you don't. I thought, not for the first time, that she might be reading my mind. It seemed like she was able to answer my unasked questions. Like she knew what I wanted to know without having to hear it. I'll come for you, sure enough. But not today. <laughs> she chuckled again. <laughs> will I know you? Or will I be like Billy? I stammered, afraid no matter the answer. Oh, at first you'll be like him. But before it's done, you'll remember me. Just like he did, she said. She shifted in her cushioned seat. Now, help an old lady up, she said, holding out her hand for me to help her. I got up off of the floor. I wasn't sure if it was safe to do so. There were still a couple of gunmen that she hadn't killed. What would they do if they saw me? Don't worry, they won't hurt you, she said, seeming to read my mind again. Now that Billy's gone, they'll give up. I stood straddling the dead body before the woman called Witch and took her hand. She had an amazingly strong grip, grasping my hand and easily pulling herself to her feet. Thank you, she said. Will you be kind when you see me again? I asked. She held my hand and patted it with her other. Don't you worry now. It'll be all right. I wasn't sure that I shared her optimism, but I nodded. I knelt awkwardly and picked up her cane, handing it to her. It was a lot heavier than I would have expected. Looking back on it, I wondered at how she was even able to lift it. But that didn't seem to occur to me at the time. Come to think about it, there were a lot of things that seemed to make sense at the time, but don't seem to now. She took the cane and released my hand. Until the next time, she said. She turned and slowly ambled toward the front door, leaning heavily on her cane. I wondered how she was going to keep from getting shot when she walked out but I don't think the cops even noticed her departure. She'd no sooner left the building when one of the other gunmen, the one who'd been watching the exits, came in to check on us. He saw me still standing over Billy's body, where I'd just helped the woman called a witch up from her chair. What happened? He asked. I, I don't know. He just fell over, I said. It sounded lame. I expected the gunman to shoot me, but he didn't even seem to question what I'd told him. He went over to the sleeping gunman and poked his toe into the man's ribs. Get up, he growled. Where's Billy? The sleeping gunman asked groggily. He's dead, the other said. What happened? I don't know. Just then the phone finally rang for the first time since we'd been taken hostage. The two gunmen stared at it. Y you going to get that? The one who'd been asleep asked. The other didn't respond. He just went to the phone and answered it. Hello? There was a long pause. Okay. He hung up the phone. What? We just surrendered, he said. We're supposed to go to the front door, set down our guns, and then go outside with our hands on our heads. The other gunman didn't seem to question it. They both got up and walked to the front door. I moved to the door of the break room to watch. The gunman did exactly what they were told to do. They put their guns down and walked outside. There was a sudden flurry of activity as the gunmen were forced to the ground. A group of cops in dark fatigue swarmed in and started pointing their guns into every corner of every room and yelling, Clear! Back and forth to each other. They ordered me down on the ground when they came into the break room. But they must have figured out that I was a hostage because they helped me back up and took me outside, along with all the other hostages. The rest was a blur. No one seemed to ask me anything that mattered. I remember that they wanted me to go to the hospital to get checked out. I refused. Other than being dehydrated and missing a couple of meals, I was physically fine. My ordeal came from watching a man die at the hands of a woman called Witch. The cops drove me home that night. I don't know how my car got there, but when I awoke the next day, it was in my driveway. I turned on the news. They said that Billy Williams died of a heart attack during the robbery, while the other two robbers were being held without bail. That was the official story. There was no mention of an old woman. And I never did find that damn rebate check again. Just as well, I guess. Now, as the days slip away, so does my recollection of what really happened. I decided to write this down before it goes completely. Before long, I know that I'll forget a woman called Witch. But someday, somewhere, I know an old woman will walk up to me and ask me if I remember her. Author's note, 
I'm Doug McIntyre, author of Woman Called Witch. As an author of horror fiction, one of the things I like to do is put normal people in unnatural situations. Maybe they're somewhere you wouldn't expect to find them, and they see something they're not supposed to. This story is a little twist on that idea. The narrator is where he's supposed to be. It's the woman who's out of place. The woman is actually the catalyst for the story. I pictured her while I was driving home from work one day, an ancient, elegant woman who exuded power. The rest of the story just fell into place around her. I hope you enjoyed the story, and I'd love to read your feedback, so please leave me a comment on the Dune Steve website. If you'd like to know more about me or check out some of my other work, you can visit my website at www.dougmcintyre.com. Until next time, I'm Doug McIntyre, and you've been listening to my story, Woman Called Witch. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening to that story. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for sending us that story, Doug. I don't know if we need to share that that was the second time through on this story. Uh, Maybe yes. Not. Push the wrong button. I pressed the wrong button. That doesn't have the same ring to it. Uh, press the wrong button. But yeah, we did have to go through that one from beginning to end twice. Bit of technical difficulties that we were able to remedy. Yeah, where was your Android then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a story that you'd like to submit to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, take a look at our website. That's dunesteef.com, and look at our submission guidelines. Yeah, just somebody, read right through it. Somebody actually types that, if you can believe it. Yes. It doesn't write itself. It's amazing. And, and we know that your stories don't write themselves, but... Uh, oh, God, what a terrible segue. But you can send us those stories at submissions at dunesteef.com. Very good. And if you have a comment about the story, you can drop us a line at editor at dunesteef.com, or you can just leave a comment post on the blog. Also, every week we do a little begging and pleading for you to donate to our podcast. Because we do, after all, pay our authors in real money, and it must come from somewhere. Do you want to tell them where it comes from? Uh, it comes right out of your children's mouths, <laughs> Big Anchorage. That's right. No, it I won't. haven't swallowed yet, Daddy. Spit it out. Pretty long. You have to pay Doug McIntyre. Spit it out! <laughs> Pretty soon I'm, I'm going to be normal-sized, Anklevich, if this keeps up. <laughs> Yes, please, if you can find it within your heart to donate, we would really love that. We have a PayPal donation button right on the website. You can just click right on it, and it will magically transport you to the donation website where you can hand over your hard-earned cash to me. And really, folks, it would be better off if Big Anklevich took your money. You would only spend it on porn again. So today's story was an interesting one. It was uh, enjoyable. It was, I, I can't be termed as anything other than a horror story. So horror is something that's near and dear to your heart. What little heart is left after doing this podcast? Eight episodes now. Time to close down this podcast. Eight episodes is far too many. I think many would say that one episode was far too many. <laughs> no, you were trying to make a point before I derailed you like a silent film actress tied to the tracks. Yes, I do like horror a great deal. It's my favorite genre. It's what I most enjoy reading. It's what I most enjoy writing. And uh, boy, I, I had a blast reading the story and even editing the story. The other day, I, we, we were editing the part where uh, she says, you know who I am. And I was just like, whoa, dude. And I don't want to pat myself on the back. I don't think it was my reading. There was just something really, really scary about that. And I had that great visceral reaction where you're just like, well, you want to look behind you and make sure there's a couple extra lights on in the room. <laughs> Horror is really unique in that it gives you that palpable sensation. The only other, well, I guess there are two other genres I can think of where you get a physical sensation. One uh, we mentioned a moment ago, and then the other would be comedy. When you can, you know, actually make somebody laugh or they involuntarily laugh. You could say... A tragedy or something like that might also give you that because you can actually induce someone to cry. That uh, might be another one of those that you might want to include in that list. No. No, I don't want to do that. Oh, okay. Just porn and, and horror. Okay. That's really all I need to get me yeah. through the day. But yeah, I really enjoy horror. Horror is actually something I'm somewhat drawn to as well. You know, it's weird. For some reason, I'm not the kind of person that will sit down and watch a horror movie. But, gosh, it seems like every time I come up with an idea for a story to write, it's always some kind of freaked-out horror-type idea. And it always ends badly. Even if it's not a horror idea, I always make them end badly. 
Uh, well, I've said it before. Horror is the one genre, except for maybe tragedy, where you can have an unhappy ending and people are still satisfied. People still enjoy it. No genre other than horror welcomes an unhappy ending so well. You know, the bad guys win or the good guy dies or the world comes to a screaming end. Or You know, one other genre that sometimes includes the sad ending or the uh, musical super villain love stories. Go Holy on. cow, you're right. <laughs> You know, I think back to all the musical supervillain love stories that I've seen through the years, and uh, yeah, Penny dies at the end of all of it. <laughs> but you know, horror gets a bad rap, man. It's it's frowned upon, and it's funny that I mentioned porn, but porn is, is frowned upon by, you know, people with morals, I guess, or not being one of them, it's hard to, to know. <laughs> but horror is, is reviled just as much, and it's seen as a low form of entertainment it's something that I'm not really able to understand. There are well-respected horror films. There are beloved horror films. But more often than not, they want to call them something else. They want to call it a thriller. <laughs> you know, psychological thriller. Or, or, or scatological thriller. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the Attack of the 80-Foot Sphincter. But so yeah, it's on. just, oh, it's such an irritation when somebody says that they have to classify something as sci-fi or as a mystery or as a thriller because horror has a bad taste to it. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, one of the most well-known authors in the world is Stephen King, who is known for writing horror. And of course, he's belittled by literature critics and so forth. And yet, everybody's read a Stephen King book at one point or another, at least. And there's other authors that are really famous for the same thing. Dean Koontz, you know, writes horror-type novels as well and has done quite well with them. Not so well with his hairpiece, but, you know, that's a different horror. <laughs> a triple. It's too bad that, you know, the critics and so forth that are in charge of shaping people's opinion make it into something laughable instead of something worthwhile and maybe a lot of horror movies have brought that upon themselves by being laughable no there's certainly that, that goes without saying that uh, there are a lot of people that just will not watch a horror movie that they'll just say it with pride oh, i don't watch horror movies and they're considered to be enlightened or something they're considered to be hey wow that guy he doesn't watch horror movies he doesn't waste his time you know, if somebody said, I don't watch chick flicks, or I don't watch Shakespearean melodramas, or I don't watch animated films, people would say, well, well you're an asshole, and they would be right. And, you know, with the horror films, they're also frowned upon, but it takes work to make something really scary. Something that stays with you, or something that chills you, or something that's just like, wow, holy cow, man. Do you remember that moment when, and uh, when you see it done by a master... It's a, an amazing thing. It's something where you can talk about it the same way that you can talk about the beautiful cinematography or something, or you can talk about the, the acting chops of so-and-so. Just... They can't say that about Stephen King's movies, though. Well, you know, that's another thing. Sometimes horror in literature doesn't translate to horror yeah. on screen. A lot of times it's what you don't see or what might be around the corner that's so scary in a book. Right. And in a movie, when you don't show something... It ends up like Blair Witch Project, which I know a lot of people think is really scary. It isn't, folks. <laughs> Wake up. What's wrong with you? It's, it's like two hours of Jaws, but you never see the shark. And then the credits roll. It's like I used to be afraid of the water. Can't imagine why. There wasn't a shark. Anyhow, uh, I guess I was trying to make a point. It doesn't matter. Oh, uh, just knowing what scares people... That's really frustrating for me. I, I've tried to write horror most of my life, and it's just funny that some things people find scary and other things people just shrug off. And maybe it's kind of like comedy, too. You know, I didn't think that was funny at all, to quote Jaws again. It's hard to know what people think it is, is scary. It's hard, because you know, I've had conversations with people who just think, fill in the blank, uh, the 1978 Amityville horror was scary, and it's not. It's uh, To me... The movie is just really, really badly made and really doesn't work on any level. I thought that the, the recent remake was so much scarier. And I know there are people that feel the complete opposite. And uh, to me, uh, The Grudge was probably the scariest movie I've ever seen. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I've talked to people that say, yeah, none of those Japanese-influenced ghost movies scare me at all. And uh, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining really scarred me as a child <laughs> there are moments when there's nothing scary going on just them driving toward the hotel at the very beginning where i'm freaked out and i don't know why maybe it's the shadow of the helicopter on the side of the mountain 
I have sat down with people who think that the Blair Witch Project was absolutely terrifying. What is scary is very subjective. Yeah, it all depends on what your experience in life is. And One of the horror films I saw as a child, and uh, it scared me forever for some reason, is Creep Show. What in particular about it? That- oh gosh, all of it. I don't know. The, the, the cockroach guy, the freaking dead people that come back from the sea to get Leslie Nielsen, the uh, thing in the crate. You know, we watched it at some friend of mine's birthday party when I was little and freak, man. I don't know if I slept well for weeks and weeks. Like what you saw when you were the age where it's easy to be scared, I guess. Maybe that's what people get scared of. Well, the kind of thing that would have scared you when you were 8 or 6 or 10 or whatever. I'm a weird exception to the rule because I'm still freaked out by every little thing. and uh, It's mostly just my own imagination of what might happen or wouldn't it be messed up if kind of thing. That reminds me of uh, when I was a teenager. My best friend and I, we would go for a drive. We lived in the country and it was two minutes out of our way to go up into the hills where there was nobody at all. It was just night and us. And we started this silly tradition of going out there and driving and then stopping the car, put, rolling the windows down, and we would say, wouldn't it be scary if... And we would just trade off seeing who can freak the other one out the most. And I still think about that kind of stuff. When I saw What Lies Beneath... I guess that would have been 2000 or 2001, whenever that came out. That night when I got home, I got it into my head that when I looked to the foot of my bed, there would be an old woman crouched down on the floor looking up at me, like a dead woman or something like that. And I could not sleep. I could not turn off the light. I just kept seeing that. I thought, what would it be like? She's coming out of the closet and crawling toward me (laughs) on her hands and knees. And holy monkey, man, I can't even put into words how afraid of this old woman I was. And maybe that was one of the reasons I like a woman called witch is, is I guess I have a fear of old women. Old women aren't generally very scary because they're physically less than powerful. But maybe it could be a standard fear. Okay, well, what, what makes you afraid? I was just thinking... Back when my youngest child was first born, I lived in, I I call it a haunted house, although there was no evidence for a haunted house, but (laughs) this is a ridiculously stupid thing to be afraid of. I remember just sitting there, my son asleep in the other room, and me in the the bedroom laying there, and I, I remember... Speaking of the old lady crawling across the floor, told you, I remember imagining my infant son crawling across the hallway, coming after me in this house. And I just thought, why does that freak me out? That is the most ridiculous thing ever. A newborn baby <laughs> coming after you. Well, I got to say, in the right hands, that could be a very terrifying image. I remember the little dancing CG baby from Ally McBeal that <laughs> people really loved and was always on websites and stuff. Freaked the hell out of me. There was something about its dead, pale <laughs> express[ion] on its face that frightened yeah. me. And did like have the a... characters from uh, Express. Polar Express. It was like a zombie movie. It wasn't like a animated movie. I don't know that that's a universal fear, the whole <laughs> infant thing. But kids just scare the crap out of me. I, little kids... One time we had a Super Bowl party at my apartment when I had a bunch of roommates. And I guess one of the guys that came over had like a a one-and-a-half-year-old or something like that. It was just walking or learning to walk or whatever. And so we were all in the uh, living room watching the Super Bowl. And I got up and I went to the bathroom. And instead of going back into the living room, I went into my room. And that little boy was there standing by my bed. And when I opened the door, he was just standing there and he looked at me and I was just, oh, I started. <laughs> and the dad came running in and got the kid out. But that night, I thought, okay, what if you were sleeping and you heard a sound and, and there was a little kid at the foot of your bed? None of your roommates had kids or any of that stuff. You didn't know who this kid was. And I was like, wouldn't that be scary? And then I thought, okay, what if you wake up a moment before that and he's crawling in through your window? And yeah, I wrote a screenplay based on that, just because the fear that I have of these silent, expressionless, strange children, that may not be something that other people are afraid of, because I've told that story to people, and they're like, so there was a kid in your room, what, do you have your dick out or something? I'm like, no, no, it was scary, because their kid shouldn't have been there, but... 
people are terrified of like spiders. I have to kill every stupid bug in my house because no one in my family will. It's a spider. It's the size of your fingernail. And they run screaming from the room and make me come in to step on it. It's a one year old child. You know, give it one good kick and it'll fly across the freaking room like Blonsky did after Hulk got him. You know, the old lady. So there's an old lady. Smack her down and you, you know, it's just crazy how that kind of, you know, and kids, I I think a lot of the weirdness that comes from being scared of kids or something like that, you can really easily make a child seem creepy if you make them wrong. You know, you make them understand things better than they should if they're suddenly adult seeming children or they don't act the way a kid should. They're just standing there looking at you. I'm thinking of Dakota Fanning while you're talking about this, and it's just, oh, gosh. Yeah, I have no nuts right now. It's just that scary. That's pretty standard for you. I'm wondering if 08OT is going to have his work cut out for him in editing this one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he will. It's funny just how subjective that is. But I, I, I stand by my statement that anything could be scary if done with finesse or done with the right attitude. A lot of people have an intense fear of clowns, and I never had that fear. Then then you see Poltergeist and just the clown doll that he has and the idea of it you yeah. know, moving around on its own and being under the bed and stuff like that. I know that has messed yeah. up millions of people. Or it's much, much scarier than Chucky, I'll have to admit. But not, right, Chucky has never been scary, but not, somebody could, with enough talent, uh, more talent than Don Mancini, isn't that the guy? Now, somebody out there could probably do something about it. No, I've seen movies where dolls are scary. Yeah. Chucky isn't one of them. Chucky isn't but I one think of them. that's because they had him swear and do things that were funny. Either intentionally Cute. funny or. Yeah. Chucky is not as scary as the clown in Poltergeist. But the clown in Poltergeist is not as scary as Jonathan Colton's creepy doll. <laughs> My grandmother, um, she had a, one of those dolls. That's large and realistic. In fact, oh, she had these things. They, they aren't even dolls. They're, they're like little statues of children that are standing in the corner covering their... Gosh, I can't even describe it. It's like you put a child in time out and he's facing the corner. <laughs> and they were like child-sized little statues really? that were always facing away. And for some reason, that would bother me. Yeah. I would like come over and visit her and there'd be that thing. And for a second there, I'd be like, oh, what is that? Somehow in the back creepy. of your mind, you know it's not alive or it's the proportions are off or something is wrong about it. And yeah, just somebody could do real nice <laughs> stuff. There was a Doctor Who episode called Blink where there were these statues that reminded me of my grandmother's <laughs> statues. And if you blinked or looked away they would come closer. They could only move closer to you or get you, you if you weren't watching. looking right at them. Mm. And yeah, it was a very scary episode, a really, really cool thing. So I guess that was the point I was trying to make is somebody with enough talent yeah, or be. enough passion or, or who understands what scares people can make anything scary. It's definitely true that it takes a lot of talent to scare people and it's really unfair to ghettoize horror or to poo-poo it and say oh it's just horror it's crap we'd like to say congratulations to doug mcintyre for putting together a good scary story and hopefully in the future we'll have a few more good scary stories to come so you were telling us a story that you never finished no i wasn't oh okay yeah i mean it's not Okay, so we would go around the bend, we would park the car, and we would try and freak each other out. And this one night, we were parked there, and we were talking about, wouldn't it be messed up if... And we came up with this idea of that we're driving around the bend, and our headlights hit this woman dressed in white. And she's got black hair, and she's standing in the middle of the street, and she's, like, wailing. And as we approach, we see that she's covered with blood in this dress. <laughs> And just as we get close to her, she raises her arm and she points at us. And anyway, Dennis told me this thing and he said, and she's sitting in the back seat right now or something like that kind of thing. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, dude, dude. And it's like, we got to go kind of thing. Um, I mean, there's more to the story, but basically, okay, so I dr shifted into drive and we just like got the hell out of there. And we were driving way faster than we should have been driving and we go around the bend, and I kid you not, there's something standing in the road, and the headlights reflect off of its eyes, and you know, we're just screaming and slamming <laughs> on the brakes. As, and, and there was a cow 
standing up right in the middle of the street. He was wearing white and black spots. So yeah, there was this cow there, but it was just one of those things where for a split second I didn't see a cow. But I saw that woman yeah. standing there. It's funny because it's been With all these black years. black hair and a white dress. And I can still remember what she looked like, even though she <laughs> never existed. <laughs> And maybe I shouldn't have shared it. Maybe it's not all that good yeah. of a story. But, well, uh, but O.T. will edit it out if it's not good enough. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's gone already. Darn. F you, O.T. <laughs> all right. So that's uh, our show. Thanks for listening. I hope you were scared, if not by the story of the cow on the road, at least by the story of the old woman in the bank. You're mocking me, aren't you? <laughs> oh, look. Our light's flashing. What light? Oh, no. Hey, o- 08 OT, can you bring up our mail? Oh. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Okay. Wow, this is a big one. I, it's a, like a gigabyte. Okay, this one says, Dear Doonstief staff, I absolutely hate your slimy, stinking, filthy, putrescent guts. Wow. You are the lowest specimens of humankind I have ever had the displeasure to have corresponded with. Your Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is a steaming pile of undulating llama droppings. The stories aren't bad, actually. Oh. But couldn't you spare us all your drivel? Couldn't you take pity on us all and cease to subject us to your inane chatter? Big Anklevich should change his handle to something more appropriate, like Big or big uh, worthless idiot. And Rish Outfield? Yes. Don't get me started on Rish Outfield. You two chunks of munge should be ashamed of yourselves. Munge? Uh, yeah. This one's really quite long. Uh, we could probably do a whole show just reading this one. I'm going to skim through this. Um, complete and utter knuckle-dragging imbecilic mouth breathers. Wow. Uh, never been kissed by anything but your pet dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, voice like a constipated goat. Yeah, what about you? Uh, wow, this this really does go on. Uh, oh, here's something nice. Okay. He says that we're good podcasters. Listen, oh, oh, it oh. is obvious to me that you two were born to be podcasters. Well, thank you. I say this because I came across a picture of the two of you on another website, and you have done the world a favor by not going into film or television. Or more likely for the two of you, direct-to-video release. Sorry, not so nice after all. Um, Let's see, uh, feces hurling primates. Um, The other night I woke up and thought I heard your podcast playing from my computer, but it turned out to be two cats mating in the alleyway. Uh, Let's see, the only difference between your podcast and projectile vomiting is that after vomiting you tend to feel better. Well, you know, I guess I'm going to skip to the end. Let's see, thank you for your time. And I really hope you read this on your podcast. It will likely be the only time I ever look forward to hearing your voice. Sincerely, your number one fan, John Smith, 223 Crescent Circle. Oh, oh dear. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Yeah. All right. Well, that's brought us to the end of our podcast. I'm going to go take my life now. Uh, Before you go. Oh, yes. This has been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big uh, Worthless Idiot, informing you that she's with Captain Hammer. And these are not the Hammer. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them.